Well, hey there. Welcome to session two of Tactics, the Shoreline Apologetics uh, class. We're learning how to share our faith with others comfortably and graciously by using the work of Greg Kukul from his book Tactics and his videos and his workbooks. And here's what we're really uh, learning how to do better. And these, this is in his words. We're learning how to skillfully manage the details of a dialogue or a conversation. We're learning how to apply principles of sound reasoning and clear thinking. We're learning how to address specific types of attacks on the faith. And we're learning how to adopt an engaging, disarming style, even when people raise objections. I know this is really helping me studying and preparing to teach this. It's really changing things for me when I approach conversations. It really is. And I've had conversations already that are just going differently. So let's review last week. What we looked at was our modest goal. Do you remember our modest goal? I had our modest goal this morning on a sort of a fast walk run up Jack's Peak here in Monterey. I had a little rock in my shoe, a stone in our shoe. And you know what's interesting about a stone in the shoe? Mine was small, so it was just bugging me. It wasn't injuring me or ruining my shoe, but it was just bugging me. So that's our modest goal, to put a stone in someone else's shoe, meaning what? It's something they're going to be thinking about. And how do we do that? We use the Columbo tactic. <clears throat> Lieutenant Columbo from the old TV series, the rumple detective with a trench coat, the uh, unlit cigar, and that sort of scratch his head, bumbling thing where he's going, you know, I, I, I just don't get it. You're a smart guy. I don't know. Wait, 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 one more question. And that's what Kukul's landed on, this sort of innocent kind of innocuous approach to somebody that puts him at ease. And then you ask the questions. And we're learning to ask questions that draw the other person out. And we do it in a non-threatening way. That's a key so that the defenses don't come up and the responses get launched. We also learned there's a 10-second window. What does that mean? In a conversation where you're hoping you can share your faith, somehow the door's open, we have kind of about 10 seconds and we need to have something we want to say, meaning a question to ask. And once the 10 seconds pass, it gets quickly less likely we'll be able to engage. We also learn that God's role is to draw the person to him. Remember, Jesus in John said, um, none come but the Holy Spirit draw them. So we talked about the fact that we're gardeners. God is the one who draws people to them. And if you think about farming, the farmer prepares the soil, pulls the weeds, gets the water going, but the farmer does not have the ability to actually make the seed grow. Only the Lord can do that. So, so God's role is to do that. And without his work, our work doesn't matter. It doesn't happen. So we have to know that. And Kukul actually uh, believes, and I agree with him, that the majority of us don't have the gift of closing the deal, of doing the altar call that draws someone to Jesus. I don't. So I shared last session. But we can all garden and do it well. And then we learn that arguments can work. Arguments can work, but when anger enters the scene, both lose. Both people lose. Why? Because anger inspires defenses. Defenses can be seen as walls and then distance. And we're less likely to have a profitable or fruitful engagement. So love and respect are paramount. When people sense you're caring for them and your respect for them, it's far less likely to stimulate defenses. And even if there's an argument, it can be a gracious argument. So I want to look now at some statements. And, and you're going to recognize some of these statements I'm going to share with you as things you've heard before. But let me go through a list of them and then tell you why we're going through a list of these. Here's some common statements non-believers make. And they're statements we're going to help you with. Kukul's helping us with his tactics approach. Here we go. Number one, it's just not rational to believe in God. 
That's a person who's presenting as a, I do science, I do empiricism, I do logic and rational stuff, so God is this non-rational concept. So the statement is, it's not rational to believe in God. Another statement you may have heard is, Christianity is basically the same as all other religions. The main similarity is this theme they share, love. And we shouldn't tell others how to live or tell others how to believe, that it's somehow just wrong on some moral scale. Third, you can't take the Bible too seriously. It was only written by men, and men make mistakes, and people made up stuff and changed stuff over time. So you just can't take it that seriously. Maybe you've heard that. I've heard it plenty of times. Here's what I heard just the other day. It's wrong to force your views on other people. How about this? You can't legislate morality. Or, or Christians involved in politics violate the separation of church and state. How about this? You can't legislate morality. You know, it's interesting. If you pause for a moment and dig into that, almost all of our laws are based on morality, aren't they? You may not go in and take something from the shelf in the store and not pay for it. Well, who said? What if I'm big enough and strong enough? Why can't I? It's not right. By what rule? By a moral rule. Everything, all the laws we follow are based on some level of ethic and morality. So it's actually not true. But we're not teaching how to defeat this person in combat. I just had to bite on that. We actually do legislate morality all the time. So let's move to this. Here's a concept that we're going to teach in this session that's really important to get. And then I'll refer back to some of the statements I just shared with you. This is called the burden of proof. And if you've purchased the workbooks, and I hope you have, or the books also, you're going to find the burden of proof in there. Here's what is meant by burden of proof. The burden of proof is the responsibility someone has to defend or give evidence for his or her view, their responsibility to give evidence for their expressed view. Here's a general rule, the way you can determine this or sum it up. Whoever makes the claim bears the burden. Why is that so important? Well, the key here is to not allow yourself to be thrust into a defensive position. And when you do that, the other person's making the claim, and how did you get on the defense? So the idea is it's not your duty to prove them wrong. It's their duty to prove their view. Whether they think it or not, we need to know that. You need to know that. The burden of proof is on the one who makes the claim. So you go back to that list I gave you. It's not rational to believe in God. That's a claim. Okay. I'm going to use the questions I've learned to ask them more about that because it's their job to prove it. They made the claim. Or you can't take the Bible too seriously because it was only written by men and men make mistakes. All right, you, that's a claim you just made. I'm going to ask questions to have them teach me more about that or share with me why they think that. The burden's on them. If I don't know this principle, you know what I'm likely to do? And I've bit on this so many times. I've taken the bait. Someone says you can't take the Bible too seriously. And I step in. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not true. Here's the truth about the Bible. And off we go. And what do we have? We have a rising tension and anger. And what's the likelihood that that person will stay engaged? Very small. You know why? The likelihood is they'll disengage, make more claims, or just battle away because they believe this for a long time. So the burden of proof is on them. That's why it's so important to know that. We will not be thrust into a defensive position if we know this. So here's some other um, sort of stances or positions we're going to encounter as we use tactics more and more. I tell you, I've, I've encountered all of these. I'm having fun even reading about them. Especially this one. Cosmic confusion. Cosmic confusion. You see, people can spin any yarn they want. They can say any 
thing they want. But if you know it's not your job to disprove it, that it's their job to prove it, you just ask questions. Here's an example. I had a conversation with a family member two weeks ago online. We were just checking in and they said, you know what? All the young people in this country are all angry. They're all expressing themselves. It's not going to stop. It's a wave sweeping the country. It's happening everywhere to all people. I said, everywhere to all people? Yes. And so I asked my first question. I said, well, have you you've checked all that out? I mean, is that what you're saying? Now you don't have to. And right then I realized this is a claim. He's making a claim. In a little bit, we'll talk about it. it's also an assertion. So when someone makes a claim or an assertion like that, if it's a real claim and they have evidence, great. But if it's an assertion and they just make the statement, I no longer feel like I'm the one that has to counter it and teach them that it's not correct. I don't have to. I don't have to do that. You see, opinions, well, let's go back to cosmic confusion. I also have distant family that I used to have more uh, engagement with years ago when we lived nearby, but they had this belief about the universe and or the cosmos. And when we talk about how we're doing, we go hang out. I say, how are you guys doing? Oh, the cosmos is watching over us. See, the universe delivered this thing for the cosmos to do for us. And I asked him, I said, I don't really, what do you mean? <laughs> What's the universe? You still hear this. Ah, uh, the universe delivered good fortune. So they can say that. And if it's a claim or an assertion, it's their job to prove it, not your job to disprove it as a believer. How does that work? What do we do next if that's what happens? Let's look into it. So let's just strengthen this this teaching around assertion and argument. You see, opinions by themselves are not proof. Intelligent belief requires reasons. And an argument is not an assertion. Let me say that again. Opinions by themselves are not proof. Intelligent belief requires reasons. An argument is not an assertion. Here's the difference. An assertion simply states a point. That's all it does. Like my family member said, all young people in this country all feel the same and they're all doing this. An argument gives supporting reasons why the point should be taken seriously. So when this family member pressed his point, I said, okay, well, there you go. I didn't, and I don't take it seriously at all. I'm very clear. They did absolutely no in-depth research over time to come up to that, come up with that uh, uh, opinion. And even when I asked a little bit, they really went down the the path of just because it's just true and there. So I, I just let go. Okay, well there you go. Think of a house. A roof for a house needs walls. The point is the roof. If it's to be taken seriously, the roof works if you have walls to support it. The walls are evidence and facts, real stuff. An assertion is a roof with no walls. It just sits there. It has nothing to support it. We need to know that. Now, we don't go saying this to people we're talking to, but we need to know it because it helps uh, guide what we're going to ask and what we're going to do with what we learn. So... Here's a critical question, and we introduced it last week, and we're going to go over and over and over it, and I just know by the end of these tactics classes, you're going to be able to recite these automatically. Here's the question, and, and I did ask my family member this. How did you come to that conclusion? I'm just curious. You see, this very question forces people to give an account for their beliefs, or bail out of the conversation in some irrational way. What do I mean by irrational way? Well, they might cite yet another assertion or claim that's also without support, like, 
Well, all young people in the country do this, and everybody knows it, and the way they know it is because social media is the, the life link of communication that all people now embrace. What? That's two assertions, maybe three in a row. So you can't prove an assertion with another assertion. It's yet another opinion unfounded, all right? So people will either begin to give evidence or they'll bail out. Some go on to do more assertions. Some just say, I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> or just say, well, whatever, I know it, and bail. But here's the thing. Either way, you learned what you need to know about future conversations with them, didn't you? Ah, that person has a tendency to assert things, but not argue with reasonable points to support it. I need to know that in dealing with that person. So again, remember the two most important questions. Number one, what do you believe? Now, we don't always have to say, what do you believe? But we do ask that question in some form or another. What I mean by that is if someone said, oh, I know there's a God out there. I don't think he's involved with us the way you do. So I might say, really? So who, what kind of a God is it? What, what do you mean when you talk about God? I'm asking their belief about that. I'm asking. The second question is, why do you believe it? I'm going to say, so how'd you get there? Again, how did you come to that conclusion? So number one, what do you believe? Number two, why do you believe it? Again, I haven't stated anything about my beliefs yet in this conversation. The point is to not do that. It isn't time. And even if someone says, well, I know that you think this and that and this and that, I can easily say, you know, actually, I haven't told you anything about what I believe. I haven't said a word. And you can say it calmly and graciously. So here's some other things we need to learn. We need to ask the questions, what do you believe, why do you believe it? We need to be aware of some scenarios that we'll encounter. Kuko labels these so that we can remember him. One, he calls professor's ploy. And what he's saying there is, you may be in a class of some type, or someone you know is, or someone you care is, and they, they report something to you, or it's something you experience. I experienced this when I was in college. I went to three different schools um, and experienced this. The professor's up front, and they make a statement, and you feel yourself put off guard, you know, kind of off balance by the statement, and you feel like, wait a minute, you want to counter it. And so what happens there is they state in such a way that you almost feel like, oh, the burden of proof to disprove him is on me. It's on me. Well, why do you feel that? Well, there's some rules to follow here. Here's one. Never make a frontal assault on an opponent who has a superior position. What do I mean? The professor's in the front of the room with the micro microphone and the focus of all the students on them and they have authority and position. They're making the assault. They're, they're making the assertions. Never go after them. You're not going to win. It's not going to happen. What do you do then in a case like that? Well, you assess your conversation environment. Ask yourself, ooh, is this one of those situations where they have the superior position? What do I remember I learned in class about how to deal with this? You assess that first. And then you ask yourself, do I really want to get in a power struggle? Because I don't have a strategic advantage here. The idea that you're going to come up with something so brilliant that just makes the professor, you know, silent and stuns the class, that's movie stuff. It's not going to happen in real life. It just doesn't. So do you do nothing? Do you do nothing? Absolutely not. See, they're putting their opinion out there. And we now are put in the position of trying to decide what we're going to do. Here's some samples and examples of what you could say in a situation like that. And again, the professor's ploy could be used in any conference, any kind of a training. I was in a conference not long ago that I needed the units for my, my psychotherapy license. And the teacher was free to say anything they wanted. And they make, made a lot of statements about religion and mindfulness 
Well, there's 120 of us in the room. I had to go through this. I saved my questions for the break. Here's a sample of some questions you can ask in this situation. Professor, can you give me a little more detail on what you mean when you said this, this, and this? And you mentioned myths about other religions, or they're all myths. Could you, could you tell me what myths uh, exactly you're talking about? Or how about this one? I'm a Christian, and I, in that class I said, I'm actually a Christian, so I'm curious about some things. Here's a question that you could say. Do you think that nothing in biblical documents has any historical value? In other words, what you're getting at is, is you're going to call them out. Do they think the whole Bible is myth and therefore of no value? But you're making it specific. Do you think nothing in the biblical documents has any historical value? Or, or this, is it your opinion that everything in this book, the Bible, is a fanciful invention of some sort? Or what's your opinion on? And you ask the question, so, so you're, you're making them put their stuff on the table, the pieces that, that you may use later if you actually do end up in a fruitful argument. And either that or they shut down and you have nowhere to go after that. So what would that mean then? It would mean they made assertions and not arguments. It's there for them and others to see. So another uh, position we need to uh, examine because we may find ourselves in it is what Google calls stumped. What do you do if you don't know what to do? You just don't know what to do in this conversation. It's just, I don't know what to do. <laughs> do nothing. No harm, no foul. Try to learn something. Try to learn something. So if you find yourself blocked, it's like, uh, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do with this. Ask yourself a question. Did they give me an argument or an assertion? It's an, if it's an assertion, you can relax and then maybe say something like this. Well, that's an interesting point of view. But what's your argument? What, what's your evidence? How do you support that? Now, if they said some things that actually cited evidence they uh, have used to make a position, you still don't know what to do with it. You know what you can say? You can say, you know what? I want to think about this. I want to look into what you said and, and really just learn more about it. It delays a finale of any kind. It just delays it. Yet it's still engaging. And what's next after stumped? It's connected to stumped. You can get out of that hot seat. And a hot seat is when the other person has dumped a ton of information on you and it's overwhelming. And what do you do? What do you do? Well, it's a ton. You're going, oh my goodness, I had no way of knowing all this info and data was coming on me. You shift immediately from being a persuader to a fact finder. Here's some things you might say. You know what? It's clear to me you know a lot more about this than me. Please tell me as clearly as you can what you believe and why or how you came to that because I'd like to learn here. I really would. You go into the student mode. You take notes and tell me, you know, I'm, I'm taking notes here or can I write a few things down? And then again, you say, let me think about it. It doesn't require you to do anything else in the moment. But if you really do feel like, well, I can come back and we can have this gracious argument, meaning an argument, each side presents facts and, and, and data in an apologia, an apologetic scenario, you can uh, do more research, learn stuff. You're still engaged with them, but you're out of the hot seat. And if you remember the questions that we're talking about and that Kukul teaches in his material, you can talk to anybody on any level. See, you cannot be intimidated because you have a fallback position of switching to student. It's a tactic, and then you can learn more. So let's do a quick recap of some of these things. Someone says to you, the Bible's been changed so many times. Or 
you don't need to have morality or. You know, there's an infinite number of universes or. The universe and or the cosmos watch over us all. Or I have my own spirituality or my own God, the way I think God is. You don't have to retreat in silence. Instead, you can ask, wow, that's very interesting. So how did you come to that conclusion of that belief? And you see, here's the reality. That person in front of you making this claim or this assertion didn't make it when they were four or five or seven or eight, so they came to it somehow. There's a path, a journey they took to get there. You can ask questions about it. I'm curious, have you always thought this? When did you feel like this more and more became your position? The whole time, you're not even saying what you believe yet. You're drawing them out to do what? To put their pieces on the table, their information on the table, for you to then consider and decide what you want to do with. So again, and let's recap this, house without walls. This is so important. An argument is a building with a roof that has walls that support that roof. The walls are made of evidence and data and facts. They are. An assertion is a roof with no walls that just sits there. Knowing how to spot this will save you energy and grief. Now, I, now, as we teach on tactics, and we have three more classes, this is so much fun. I hope it is for you, because I'm learning how to do more and more of this as I, I live each day in the world I, I live in and inhabit, my sphere. And I hope you are as well. But at the same time, I'm watching other apologists. I'm reading more apologetic material. You can watch things like the One Minute Apologist on YouTube. You can watch short teachings by Rabbi Zacharias, Abdu Murray, um, Greg Kukul himself, um, Dr. Timothy Keller. Um, gosh, there's so many. Really, Mike um, Lacana, Lacana. There are so many apologists out there. Take this time in between classes to start equipping yourself. Better answers to tough questions, more background, more theology. Then you have just more and more in your backpack. So I'm glad you've joined us. I look forward to our group after the video to deal with some of the questions uh, that help us kind of cement and ingest uh, these tactics so that they become more and more uh, automatic for us to use in the specific scenarios we find ourselves giving us the opportunity to share our faith and to scatter seed as we find it in Mark chapter 4. Beautiful parable. So until next session, I'll see you then and God bless. Thanks so much for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday Night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for the tactics class. We look forward to spending more time with you in deeper reflection and discussion. See you there.